Okay, this is week two, um, lecture one. We're going to go through aorta um, all the way through to renals. So, um, again, like I said, a lot of this stuff is for you. So you should already know the location of the abdominal aorta. You should know it originates at the left ventricle, and it descends anteriorly towards the um, anterior to the spine and to the left of the IVC. The upper limits of normal, it should never exceed three centimeters, or it would be considered an aneurysm. And the average diameter is about two centimeters, um, and then it should taper all the way down at the iliacs, measuring about one and a half centimeters each. Now, if one of the iliacs is larger than the other, that's considered an aneurysm, or if a more distal portion is larger than the more proximal portion that is also considered an aneurysm. So again, it should gradually taper towards the bifurcation. Normal variants, um, it may be tortuous. There will often be renal duplication in 25% of the population. Uh, sonographically, the walls are going to be very echogenic with an anechoemin. And the patient prep for the aorta is 8 to 12 hours fasting. Of course, if they come in through the ER, um, regardless of whether or not they're fasting, we're going to try and make an attempt to do the exam because it is an emergency and they're looking for something like an aneurysm. So there is no prep if they present through the ER. <clears throat> patient position, usually we start off with our patient supine. Um, if that's not helping, we might turn them right lateral decubitus. But again, anything goes as long as you get the image. So different patient positions um, can be used as long as you document what position you're using on the films. Indications. These are some of the indications, but not all. To find all of the indications, you want to visit the AIUM guidelines and protocols for um, the abdominal aorta. And they're all listed in the, um, well, the first section, um, it says AIUM protocols, but I also copied some of them alongside the um, actual exams you're going to be performing like you should probably have already looked at the AIUM guidelines for an aorta ultrasound when you did the aorta lab but I want you to visit all of them because it's going to tell you all the indications it also goes into screening for aorta so there's a different set of indications for screening so some of the indications would be the pulsatile abdominal mass um, if the patient presents with abdominal pain back pain, an abdominal brewery. Again, that's something that they heard that refers to um, turbulence. And if the patient has hypertension, that might be a reason for an aorta ultrasound. IVC, it originates at the junction of the two common iliac veins, anterior to the fifth lumbar vertebrae. The measurements are going to be variable with respiration. Um, and the upper limits of normal, according to this source, is like 3.7. Now, I know I told you this before in other classes. If the patient is performing a Valsalva maneuver and they're holding their breath and bearing down, it can go up to 4 centimeters, but it should never exceed that. So it's going to kind of go up and down with um, respiration. It is possible that they may have a duplicate IVC or a portion of it. It may be tortuous. Sonographically, the lumen is also going to be anechoic with thin echogenic walls. Patient prep, fasting for 8 to 12 hours. Patient position, supine or lateral decubitus. Um, typically for both aorta and IVC, about a 3.5 to 5 megahertz transducer um, is recommended course, we always want to use the highest frequency possible that allows for enough penetration. If you have a larger patient, you're going to have to drop down to like a two and a half megahertz. <clears throat> Indications for an IVC, uh, you might want to be checking for an ASD waveform. You may be doing an evaluation of an IVC filter. These are some of the things we talked about in intro to vascular. 
renal vein thrombosis, tumor that's invaded into the IVC, most likely from the renal vein, from renal cell carcinoma, or we might actually be looking for an arterial venous fistula. Again, these are all the things we kind of discussed in the last class. But for all of the indications and also for screening, look, in, uh, look at the handout in the AIUM guidelines, okay, so and the aorta protocol, and I believe in the book it's still page 51, but I'm not sure which edition you guys are using, so the page numbers might be a little bit different, so just look in the um, contents in the front where it tells you the page numbers for each one. So depending on yeah what actual edition you have, that might be a little different. <clears throat> Liver, right side of the upper abdomen, lies between the level of the nipples to the level of the eighth and ninth rib. It is the most anterior organ of the peritoneal cavity. The left lobe lies in the left hypochondriac and epigastric regions and the right lobe occupies pretty much all of the right hypochondrium. The caudate lobe is located on the posterior surface of the liver. And again, this is stuff by now I would hope you definitely know. Normal measurements. It's the largest internal organ. The right lobe is six times larger than that of the left. And you don't necessarily have to know what it weighs, but an adult liver weighs about 1,400 to 1,800 grams. Um, you may be asked to do measurements. Wherever you go, you're going to do um, whatever they ask. The most common measurement they perform out in the field would be the AP measurement because it's really hard to get the entire length in because to get the entire length in, you would have to have the liver like this, and a length measurement would basically go from just like what you would do with the spleen. You would go from here to here, and that would be really hard for you guys to do. So most of the time they do AP measurements, which is gonna be from here to here of the right lobe. But again, you're gonna do whatever it is they ask you to do. And then the transverse measurement is 16 centimeters. So make sure you're familiar with the normal measurements, and again, whatever they ask you to do, you're gonna do. Normal variants, a right L's lobe, it's an extension of the right lobe below the inferior border of the right kidney. They may have an absent left lobe. And then, of course, the size and shape is going to vary with body habitus. You should also be familiar with the lab values that are associated with particular organs because that's going to lead you um, sometimes those are clues as to what we're looking for. So hopefully by now, like I said, you're, you're pretty familiar with all these lab values. So make sure you remember all of these point somehow towards the liver. Sonographic appearance. The liver is homogeneous with medium level echoes. It should appear hyperechoic to the normal renal parenchyma, or the cortex of the renal, hypoechoic to the normal pancreas tissue. You're going to see anechoic blood vessels and ducts and echogenic ligaments and fissures. Patient prep, again, fasting. Whenever our patients are fasting, it's a minimum of eight hours. Patient position, supine, decubitus. Whatever, um, whatever helps you get the image, as long as you document it again on the films. And you're pretty much going to probably start with your average size patient with a 3.5 or 5 megahertz convex array. Indications for a liver exam. And again, these are just a few. I would go visit the AIUM guidelines. Um, abdominal discomfort abnormal liver function test, jaundice, hepatomegaly on a physical exam. Um, I believe there's a link in your PowerPoint to a liver biopsy film. There should be links 
in um, several areas of the PowerPoints. So make sure that you do visit those. If there isn't a link, just Google liver biopsy. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in there, but just Google it and, and, and watch a YouTube video on that. Gallbladder and biliary tract. The gallbladder is in the right upper quadrant. It sits along the posterior aspect of the right lobe. The <clears throat> common duct is superior to the gallbladder. The common bile duct is lateral to the common hepatic artery. And the CBD is anterior to the portal vein. Now, you will be, I promise you, on your abdomen registry, they're going to ask you about the Mickey Mouse sign. This is the portal vein, right? And then they're going to ask you about what the two ears are, and they're going to ask you the locations. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so they're going to ask you um, the CBD, okay, is coming out of the liver, so this is going to be the CBD. I can't write with this. And then the hepatic artery is coming in from the medial side, so this should be the hepatic artery. So they're going to ask about the location. And if you go back to um, cross-sectional and revisit your notes, we went over this several times about the location. All right, normal measurements. Normal gallbladder size is variable. Again, it depends on whether or not they're fasting. Upper limits of normal for the gallbladder is 3 centimeters wide, 7 to 10 centimeters long. The CHD is 4 millimeters, and the CBD is 6 millimeters, according to this source. I try to be consistent with your sources, but you know sometimes some sources will say 7 millimeters. Um, but what's pretty consistent is post-cholecystectomy, it's about 10 millimeters. So you're always going to pick the best answer. They're not going to give you anything that's way off. It's going to be within a, a within millimeters of each other. <clears throat> Normal variance. Um, it can be in various locations. They may have a Hartman's pouch, a Phrygian cap, which is a fold in the fundus. Septations are very common or folds. Um, it is not very common to have a duplicate CBD, but it is possible. And lab values, again, mostly pointing at gallbladder would be your bilirubin direct and non-direct. Sonographically, the gallbladder is anechoic with echogenic walls, um, anechoic tubular ducts with um, echogenic walls, Patient prep, fasting, minimum of eight hours. Patient position, of course, anything goes. But when you're evaluating the gallbladder, it's important that you look at sagittal and transverse images in supine, and then you must turn them to cubitus every time you evaluate a gallbladder. So when you're writing your technical impressions, you're going to write down to multiple sagittal and transverse images um, in, in sagittal and in cubitus positions demonstrate. So you got to make sure that you mention that you turned your patient. Indications, right upper quadrant pain, a positive Murphy sign. Now, if you don't write down on your report that they had a positive Murphy sign, say you didn't even check, they're going to assume it's negative. So unless you check and unless you document that, it's going to be reported as a negative Murphy sign on the report. So it's your job to comment on whether or not they have a positive or a negative Murphy sign. If you write nothing, they're going to assume it's negative. <clears throat> Pain radiating to the right shoulder. Um, they may present with nausea, vomiting, fatty food intolerance, and jaundice. Pancreas, 
extends, the, the tail of the pancreas extends from the hilum of the spleen, and the head ends around the C loop of the duodenum. It's located primarily in the epigastric region, and we know that the shape can vary a little bit. Um, it isn't standard to measure every part of the pancreas. You should still be familiar with what those normal measurements are in case it's abnormally large. You should only measure it if you think it's enlarged or if you see a mass. So again, be familiar with the measurements, but it isn't routine to actually measure it. And then, of course, be familiar with the lab values that lead or point towards pancreas. Sonographically, what should it look like? It's going to be homogeneous, medium level gray, equal to or slightly more echogenic than that of the liver. Okay, so again, it also depends on the age. There might be some variations, but you're doing your comparison when you report the echogenicity of the pancreas, you're always comparing that to the liver's echogenicity. For the best imaging, of course, fasting for a minimum of eight hours. Um, you can give your patient water just as long as you make sure they're not MP or any other procedure or they're not going to surgery or anything like that. So you want to make sure you check um, whenever you're going to give your patient water. Make sure nobody else is, has to do any kind of imaging first and it might interfere with their exam. <clears throat> Indications for a pancreas exam would be epigastric pain. Um, they may have abnormal pancreatic enzymes. They may be elevated. Painless jaundice um, with possible right upper quadrant mass. Unexplained weight loss, bloating, nausea, vomiting, and a very common sign that there's an issue with the pancreas is a very fatty uh, feces or white feces. That's usually an indication of pancreas issues. And then um, the kidneys uh, location. Of course, there's two kidneys um, located on each side of the spine between the 12th thoracic and 4th lumbar vertebrae. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney because it's displaced a little bit by the size of the liver. Kidneys are anterior to the psoas and quadratus lumborum muscles. Again, they're going to probably ask you that on the registry. Normal measurements, 9 to 12 centimeters long, 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters AP, and 4 to 5 centimeters wide. And again, lab values that point towards kidneys your BUN and creatinine. Normal variants, dromedary hump, okay, more common on the lateral edge of the left kidney. It's not uncommon to have a duplicate collecting system. Also a little bit more common on the left side, especially in women. Horseshoe kidney, it's more common for the kidneys to be connected at the inferior poles, but it doesn't have to be. Any type of ectopic uh, kidney in any location, if it's not where it's supposed to be, the first place to check would be the pelvis. Hypertrophied columns of Bertin that can be mistaken for a mass at times. That's not uncommon. Sonographically, the sinus is going to appear very echogenic. The pelvis is probably not going to be seen or anechoic. And if you do see a prominent renal pelvis that may look like pseudohydronephrosis, make sure you have your patient void and come back and re-image. Okay, because there really shouldn't, you shouldn't see the pelvis unless there's some urine in there. I mean, you want to make sure it's not just retained fluid or it's just pseudohydronephrosis. The cortex is going to be homogeneous, medium level gray to low level gray. Um, the pyramids are going to be hypochoic to anechoic, triangular shaped, equal, equally spaced um, throughout the cortex.
patient prep there any. However, I find that it's easier to image when they're fasting and when they're hydrated. Um, we want to eliminate bowel gas whenever we're doing anything in the abdomen. Patient position, supine, right or left lateral decubitus, and often we use prone as well. <clears throat> Transducer again, three and a half to start, usually on your average size patient, and the highest frequency possible that allows for enough penetration. And then if, uh, rather than switching the frequency, you might want to try coming around from the back because we'll get better resolution if we get closer to the organ. Indications, um, frequent UTIs, a palpable mass, abnormal labs, BUN and creatinine, severe flank pain, um, that's often a sign of, of kidney issues, hematuria or decreased urine output or any type of trauma in the region of the kidneys would be a, re a reason for evaluating kidneys. And then of course check out the protocol um, worksheet in the AIUM guidelines and as far as the page numbers again that's close depending on what edition you have. Okay, so we're going to stop this. This is part one, and the second lecture will be from the spleen through the breast.